Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to be taking a look at the United States during the 1950s, and we're going to understand why this era is looked at uniquely different than what had come before, as well as what had come before. Uh, after and why this era is sometimes referred to as the affluent age. So let's get started. Following the war, the Second World War, we see that the American economy sees a lot of growth really, really fast. There's a lot of new innovations that transform the daily lives of most Americans and in ways that just had not existed previously. Yes, we see that after the war in 46 through 49, there's a big post-war boom that happens. Part of that is based on the transformation of the economy, though. But the 50s are where all that money kind of takes a whole new cultural shift with it. The terminology of this affluence, I mean, is where we see there's abundance, there's stuff, and there's more stuff to go around. The war years are over, the ration years are over, the New Deal years and the Depression years, they're gone. And this meant that for the first time in decades, Americans had a new amount of cash that they just had not had previously. Uh, a good example of this is the fact that the average income tripled for Americans from 1940 to 1960. It saw more of everything. I mean, just imagine if your take-home salary, the amount of money you make, if it tripled in your life in a matter of years, you'd have more money for the things you want, the items you want, the things to make your family more comfortable, a car, a home, new ele electronics, new appliances, everything. And it's not just that there's more money, but the job market itself is radically changing as well. There's new technologies that make factory work more efficient, that make farm labor more efficient. And all of a sudden you don't need as many people to do those jobs. And this creates the office job instead, the white collar job, the clerical, the executive job as opposed to the person who is physically making the things. And these are two types of jobs that really start seeing massive transformations during this time in both the ability to produce and the ability to earn. With the fear of the Soviet Union as the looming Cold War presence, there was always the goal of one-upping the Soviets to show that capitalism was superior than communism. And with that, we see there is bigger production that starts happening. There is more stuff available to more persons. And there is the big shift away from what both sides are making. There is a huge change in, in unionization as well the old labor unions, the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations, these were the two big faces of unions in the country. And they each were part of the large umbrella unions. Now there were smaller unions that did not affect or be part of either the AFL or the CIO. But again, these are smaller ones. When these two merged in 1955, most unions were essentially part of the same family, which meant most workers who were part of a union fell under this very, very large umbrella. Let's cut right to the meat of this. What this means is most American workers who are part of a union are now part of a very large union entity. More persons working with the union means it's easier for demands to be made, demands to be met, and things to happen to facilitate for the workplace. It's a large social contract. And these union workers really do see a lot of prosperity that the 50s shows. Now, we all have that thing that, you know, if we're saving a little more, if we're putting a little more aside, I would like a dot, dot, dot. Maybe it's a new phone, maybe it's a car, but 
it's pretty safe to say just about everybody wants a place of their own at some point in their life. And I can look at any point in America's history and the notion of freedom, independence, has always been associated with land ownership. All this new cash really does create the idea of owning a home much easier than it ever had before. And with all these new homes being created, we see the rise of the suburbs. And this has become so much a part of American slang that it's, it's almost hard to imagine that this was a new invention in the 50s a collection of communities and houses close to where you're working but not within the city proper that you're working one of the best things that we can see with the rise of suburbia is the rise of cheap houses and cheap housing uh, levittown is one of the big ones that would do this and this was levittown in new york and we see that, largely speaking, the Levittown homes are the same thing. Uh, they just have the same three models that you swap the paint, different house. You swap the shutters, different house. You can see here there's three different models, but again, it's the same house in all of suburbia. So all the houses in all the community looks all the same. This is cheap like i mean you can see the price tag there eighty four hundred dollars for a brand new home i mean today you're lucky if you can find a home a decent home for 10 times that amount this is the era of the baby boom the american birth rate goes through the roof uh, the soldiers come home hadn't seen the wife in a couple of years and you get a couple of kiddos following that but it's worth pointing out that the suburbs were definitely the icon of segregation and how segregation continued to exist. It was extremely common for suburb homeowner associations to have the rule of we are only selling, maintaining, and buying to white customers. We are not going to do this to black customers at all. And this as you can imagine, led to a race-based division that slowly started to become part of the norm throughout suburbia, where even if you had an African-American family with the money, the people who own the homes and justify homeowner insurance will not sell to African-Americans. And this led to, well, like you can imagine, suburban segregation and urban segregation in the city propers though the cities start to see wow there's a lot of people who are going to these suburbs and living in a life like that let's renovate downtown let's tear up and and bulldoze the poor neighborhoods to create new more valuable real estate whether that's apartments or condos or, or brownstones or brickstones or or houses or whatever and and that happens so now you've got an even larger problem that's slowly starting to exist for the people who used to live in those parts of town that now no longer exist and you cannot go to the suburbs for some folks this means you just got to move the 50s also see this rise of having more than the other guy. You have it because the other guy doesn't have it. You have it because that guy has it. You might not need a new TV, but when you see Ralph carrying in a brand new 25 inch color, you think to yourself, wow, I need to keep up with him. I need to do that as well. People have more money which means they can spend it on the things that we would consider a normal appliance what was considered a luxury appliance seven decades ago a washing machine a vacuum cleaner a refrigerator these are simple things but when you don't have it you understand how much you want it imagine a, a, a lawnmower if you've ever seen a, a man a, a human powered push lawnmower as opposed to a lawnmower with an engine inside it and i don't mean one that moves the wheels i mean one that moves the blade 
you understand that this can be a real status symbol as well as a real labor saving thing. In the 50s, we also start to see that TV will start to replace radio. Uh, people are going to get more of their information from the television. They're going to go to TV for news, for media, for information, as well as for entertainment. Entertainment. This is the background to, to everything. Yes, you can turn on the radio still and you can listen to the ball game or you can actually watch it instead of someone telling you about it. Sure, you could have listened to the radio show The Shadow, a very popular radio show that ran for many years, or you can watch the crime fighter fight the bad guys and not just hear the story as it's being told to you. Now, admittedly, if you've ever seen some of these older programs from the 50s, um, Leave it to Beaver, Dick Van Dyke, or even the 60s like Bewitched, these are very, very bland um, creations. Yes, it is idyllic. Yes, it is perfect. But in that 30 minute program, every problem is solved within a half an hour. And the worst problem that anyone has is that a shirt is burned or the casserole wasn't cooked, or you know somebody washed the car and they used the wrong kind of soap and the car is full of soap or something like that. But it works. And not only is this gonna work to get people entertained, it also is gonna work to get people to buy stuff. Even where we eat and how we eat. I mean, think about how often you eat a meal while watching something. Now, I don't, it doesn't have to be in front of a television, but in front of your phone, in front of an iPad or a tablet, that's the norm. That's so much the norm that, well, it had to start from somewhere. It really does start with the 50s, the idea of the TV dinner. Imagine it, you can take this meal that was frozen in your icebox, stick it in your oven, walk away, 20 minutes later, you come back and it's ready to go. The TV tray, sure, you can sit with your family and talk about your day, but you can also sit with your family and watch a program. All new types of things start to come out. And all of this happens during the 50s. 50s also see some big changes to business as well. The ideas of both a multinational corporation like McDonald's and a franchise McDonald's too. Now for this case, we're gonna talk about both in tandem. A multinational corporation is a business that has reach across, as you can imagine, with a name like this, lots of different countries, usually across like oceans, not just the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Sometimes you use your overseas market to make the good. Now McDonald's really doesn't do this, but like clothing does. Like you look at your t-shirt tag and it says made in Taiwan, but it was sold at your local Target. That's a multinational clothing corporation. Franchises, McDonald's is a good example of. You have your, your store, McDonald's, and you can buy the franchise, the ability to open up your own McDonald's. You have to pay the corporate office a lump sum and usually also an annual sum, but that store is yours. It is the McDonald's name. You are selling the same thing every McDonald's sells. Big Mac, Chicken McNuggets, Happy Meals, you name it, this sells it. What's great about the franchise is, well, think about the last, if you've ever moved or travel long distance or a road trip and you see a McDonald's on the side of the road, you know what they sell. You're not gonna get out and have to look at the menu and decide. You're walking up to the counter, you know what you're getting from McDonald's because you get it at your McDonald's at home. It's the same thing. And there's a bunch of them too. This franchise stuff, it's a game changer. The rise of TV 
also changes how people go to the movies. And initially there's a real big drop off in people going to the movies. Uh, you have to pay the money. You have to see a story that you would see on TV anyways. You have to sit with a whole bunch of people. But theaters realize that we need something new to get people in the door. We need a gimmick. We need a thing. Otherwise, people are just going to stay at home and watch what they can already watch. So some theaters start doing the, the giveaways, the door prizes. Come buy your ticket come watch the movie and who knows you might walk away with a set of new dishes you could walk away with toys for the kiddos gimmicks like 3d film you know you wear these special glasses the film is recorded a certain way and you have the illusion that you're in the action too studios know they need something to change up what it means to going to the movies and thus the blockbuster films come out think about avengers the marvel cinematic universe these are giant names huge billing actors actresses huge effects budgets able to dominate whatever it is it's the kind of thing that will make a hundred million dollars. It's the movie Monday morning everybody is talking about. And if you don't see it by Tuesday, you're behind. This is it. And you can sell all your advertisement for this brand new movie on the theater. It on the TV, it changes everything. Radio does still stick around. It's not like, you know, there's TV, there's movies, and people just stop listening to the radio. It does start to change, though, because radios start to specialize in a specific genre of music, a specific genre of entertainment. You've got the channel for country western, the channel for what we now call R&B or rock and roll, uh, rap, hip hop, those wouldn't exist in the 50s, but maybe your weather sections, your news sections, all of these things are the preset on your dial that you would just naturally go to. And the invention of the transistor makes the radio much smaller than it had ever been. You could now carry a radio in your pocket. And again, for the 50s, that was a status symbol. Ta -da! When I say computer, you probably have a very specific image in your head. That image that you see on the screen right now, that was a computer. Prior to transistors, prior to microprocessors and basic processors, a computer was a machine as big as a room and it was used for very complicated mathematical things our earlier computers colossus eniac univac really changed how humans could do computational math over time yes they would become more consumer friendly uh, the last time i needed to use computational math was college algebra it's not the kind of thing i use all the time but the computer i am using right now to convey this information to you i use every day medicine also makes a series of tremendous leaps during this time uh, salk develops the polio vaccine people injected with a weaker version of polio so the body knows how to fight it polio cripples the body cripples the legs uh, eventually you will die from it um it's a it, it was a terrible thing but vaccination wiped it out we don't have to worry about this ever again and that's that's wonderful this the americans launched the first satellite in 58 admittedly after the soviets put one up there first and jet air makes air travel four to five times faster than it had been before for women, the idea of the workplace takes a really different tone as well. See, during the war years, yes, the women are working, the men are going to fight. And then when the men come home from the war, the women's place kind of is this thing in limbo. Some women stay 
in the workplace, but most women don't. It is expected that if a woman wanted to work, she could, as long as it was clearly understood, once the husband shows up, once you're married, your life is going to revolve around him. Once you have kids, you're definitely not going to work ever again. Um, you've got maybe 20 years before you might work again, and that's might. The expectation was that women stay at home and not work. The big jumps for equality and feminism in this country, they're going to hit the pause button here for the next couple of years. And I mean, the advertisement that you can see here really does showcase this, the idea of, well, here's mom in the kitchen. Here's mom and her new washing machine. She sure does look happy. Why would she ever want to walk away from that roast? Rock and roll, as we see it, as we think, is this product. And it was a reactionary music movement that really gets started because of this disc jockey. His name is Alan Freed, and he notices that you've got your white kids that are dancing to the music that was associated with African Americans, what had been referred to as, well, rhythm music, blues music. Now, Freed saw that this is a market to go in, and he starts making these, his radio show all about this new type of music. They rebrand it from what it had been called to rock and roll. And in almost this moment of, you know, let's just, we're rocking and we're rolling. And that was it. The genre was named. You have your mega stars like Elvis, who are popular for the music. People would listen to it. But then when they see Elvis dancing and incorporating rhythmic dancing, he was banned. People would go to his uh, shows and and pass out from excitement of seeing this man shaking his legs. There's this also rise musically of the beatnik movement, and Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac are two of our big beat writers. Uh, bongo drum poetry almost, wherein the message of standing up to the man standing up to the system are played out and hammered out don't listen to the way things are don't listen to what's going on you're different you're your own person fight for that thing these are products of the 50s in the idea of let's keep fighting the th Thing, the man, the system. We fought fascism, we come back, and this is what it is? No thank you. Unfortunately, we see that for African American entertainers, that they are not as accepted as white entertainers are. On the big national shows, the, the evening entertainment shows, African American entertainers are not booked. Uh, the rock and roll that they really, that it was synonymous with African Americans, is played in a whole different genre and thing than we had seen before. Some people really thought that the this new group of young people is taking their focus away from where it should be. Uh, a lot of people said that you know, oh these young people they're just rebelling against the system they're looking for anything they can a quick thrill a fast music they want the newest thing can't they just be happy with where they are these darn young people and the emergence of this pop culture transformation was kind of a reaction to well heck everything that had happened immediately following the war as well as the consistent commonality that life had become. The idea of, I want that thing because it makes me happy, as well as the, I gotta fight the man because 
I want to be my own thing. Impulse control, pleasure, and ways that had just not been the norm are slowly becoming more accepted during this time. So today we talked about the rise of the affluent age in this country. Hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.